My name is Line Dammenlund. I am Rector of the Royal Danish Academy. And I am so pleased to be able to introduce Dorte Mandrup, which will be, who will give a lecture in a little while. Um, but before I delve into uh, the remarkable work, we delve into the remarkable work that Dorte has done, let me briefly introduce the Royal Danish Academy, where I am rector. It's founded in 1754 and uh, has fostered generations of architects who has shaped the world with their design, while also instilling the importance of cultural heritage and sustainable design. We have around 1,200 students of architecture, design and conservation, and uh, maybe you have been visiting the science track if not, I can recommend it. Uh, this has been uh, designed by some of our leading researchers. I do really hope you can find uh, time for that too during these two, three busy days. Actually, I have known uh, Dorte since we were both students at the uh, School of Architecture in Aarhus. Uh, I'm not going to say how many years ago that is, <laughs> but it's uh, a few. Um, in those days, architecture was dominated by big projects, theoretical and quite abstract projects. There was a lot of French philosophers on our reading list. You probably read some of those too, Dorte, uh, but I actually remember your projects as being the opposite of the prevailing abstractions. Your diploma project was small scale, concrete and not very abstract, but full of empathy. Empathy is something we need more of as human beings. The sustainable development goals, the theme of this UIA, are basically about a balance, a pursuit of the goals for prosperity for everyone on the planet while protecting the planet itself. This dual perspective embodies the acknowledgement that people and nature are intrinsically inseparable a view that many of us have not had since the beginning of modernity. We urgently need to empathize with nature. In fact, we need more empathy in this world altogether. Empathy is very much built through our senses. And Dorte, you are the master of activating all one's senses in the buildings you design. Smell, touch, sight and sound. Empathy in your architectural design is expressed in many ways. The spaces, the materials, the light. These are some of the many things we can learn from your work, Dorte. Along the way, the scale of your projects have grown in size, but nevertheless, they are designed with an insightfulness that addresses both environmental and societal context. And no matter the size, they always invite to what we in Danish call nærvær, in English, presence. Your works, Dorte, are very inspirational, not only among our students, but to architects and students and clients all over the world. Please, Dorte, the stage is yours. Kathleen. Um, thank you so much, Lena, for the nice introduction. I won't talk about our, our times in university, um, but I remember you being very theoretical. So, <laughs> anyway. Um, Good morning, and uh, thank you all for coming here. This It's very early, I was afraid nobody would be here, but I mean, thanks. Um, we say that uh, context is king or queen, uh, because everything we do is uh, deriving from the context that we are working in, which means also that uh, uh, our projects all look um, quite different, I think, uh, because we try to find the potential in each uh, place, um, and then we try to expose it, uh, and sometimes also uh, change the, the place we're in. So there are, the context is, of course, also global, so it's about um, behaving as sustainable as possible where you are, uh, but it's also about the local context. Uh, and since we are now here uh, at the daylight talk, part of the local context, of course, is the daylight. Uh, which is very different, I think, in the north than, um, than further down south. So, 
I brought uh, three and a half projects today uh, that are all uh, on the northern hemisphere. Uh, one is in Greenland, one in Denmark, um, and uh, and one is in Norway. Uh, and then I am showing a few pictures from uh, Babi uh, which is a project that, that's not gonna be built, but um, uh, nevertheless is uh, is an important project to us. So when you work with daylight as part of the, uh, the conditions and the northern light, uh, there's, there's certain things that are uh, extremely important. One is that the, the amount of light is, uh, is less uh, and the amount of blue light that is diffused in the sky is also less because the, the distance uh, from the sun is longer. Uh, but that also means that you have a sky that feels uh, much more open. And when you're really in the Arctic, you have a lot less um, particles uh, in the air, meaning that you could you have a distance, um, you have a, a, a possible distance that that's a lot longer than when you are in a polluted uh, city. So you can see really far, meaning that you have uh, no sense of distance. It's kind of um, infinite. Working. Um, with the different projects here, uh, they relate also very differently. One is like this uh, in the Arctic. It's about rhythm and movement and repetition. Um, another one is more uh, about surface and texture and uh, being in this very diffuse light, uh, being able to exaggerate in a way the, the, um, the sensitivity to the material. And then Babia uh, is all about uh, trying to take the color out of the daylight because you're you're underground. And with the well, uh, we work with the reflection of the uh, surface of the water uh, to to use that as a reflector uh, inside the building, uh, reflecting the, the light on the the shell of the building. But we can start with the water and sea, uh, and of course conditions is much more than daylight also, so I'll, I'll talk uh, you through the projects, not only uh, relating to, to daylight. But the water and sea uh, is a very uh, shallow uh, sea surface, and it's um, uh, changing all the time because you have the tide, and the tide will change the landscape, and the marsh around it is also very horizontal. So. In this um, shallow sea bottom, um, you have birds feeding from the migrating route coming from the north uh, to Africa two times a year. Uh, about uh, between 10 and 15 million birds are feeding here. So uh, the, the area is protected by UNESCO, not because it's beautiful. Uh, it is also beautiful when you get used to it, but um, it's also an, an extremely um, important feeding area for birds and also seals and other animals. So this phenomenon, uh, which is called Starling Magic, I think in English we call it Black Sun, um, people come to see this, so it's also part of a tourist uh, uh, potential uh, in this outskirts area of, of Denmark. So the competition that we did uh, was about um, adding a new building uh, to an existing building from the 90s, uh, and by doing that, um, making, creating a whole new exhibition center uh, on, on the, in this small village. And the existing building was not um, architecturally all that interesting, but uh, we tried to keep as much as possible uh, to keep the, the budget, uh, first of all, but also, of course, to, to sustain what's there, uh, which is, uh, as everybody know now, uh, the most sustainable thing yet that you can do. So, so adding to this building um, was quite uh, difficult because it was white and had red roof and it was looking like a farmhouse, but it was actually from the 90s. So what we did was to add the new building around the old building. Um, but as you see here, uh, you have the, the existing building and by adding the new building around, we could embrace it um, and create a whole new s sort of super uh, size uh, farmhouse uh, in, this, in this place. So uh, here's the work model uh, of the existing building and the new buildings on the outside uh, with the new boathouse um, in the access. Also this area is uh, old Viking ground, so um, it was quite a fertile, 
fertile area, so you had Viking farms around, um, and this is the reconstruction of a Viking longhouse, uh, which is actually a very interesting study, but I'll tell you about that another time, how they, uh, they constructed this as a geometric um, uh, system, very, very simple, um, but using the thatched uh, material as roof and, and the, the clay as the, the walls and, of course, a, a, a timber construction. So, since the uh, reed is grown quite close by, it was an easy material, but it's also a material that, that, um, that has the, the, the texture and the, um, the color uh, of the landscape around, and we really wanted this uh, building to, to grow from the landscape um, and to protect uh, the inner courtyard from the wind. So using the thatch material was quite natural, but using it on the roof and on all the, the walls and the, and the overhang. So um, the Vikings uh, used almost the same um, technique to, 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 to create these um, roofs. So when, when you look at this, it's actually not cut very much. It's actually hit uh, into place. So you can see that everything here is kind of um, has the mark of, uh, of the hand. Then when you are on a very shallow surface and you are, you are in Denmark and two-thirds of the time you have um, an overcast on the sky, so you have the diffused light and it's changing um, most, uh, most of the day, I think, um, many, many times. So uh, when you look at the, the pictures here, you can see how the material in a way reflects the, the light of the, of the sky in very, very different ways. So it kind of changes with, uh, with the daylight, even though the daylight... Um, is always, uh, um, you know, coming through uh, some kind of, of uh, overcast. And then, what I love as a as a northerner is, of course, the um, the long um, blue um, sky that you have. Um, also, because the sun is is of course down, but but it will come up quite soon again. So in the summer times, these kind of um, vibrant uh, blue skies is 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 really part of also understanding the. The, the building as a sculpture or as, as a black um, shadow in front of the of the sky, and as you see here, the the the, the over exaggerated you could say texture created by hand by hitting the board, um, and you have this feeling of being very um, present uh, close to this material. And the coloring, of course, with the with the natural um, with the with the ground and, and everything. So the interior is uh, creating kind of a, um, a lee uh, area because there's a lot of wind here. Uh, and also we wanted the existing building and the new building to, um, to merge. Um, of course, you need to see what's existing, what is new. Uh, so we clad the uh, existing building with uh, Robinia, which is a um, central European uh, hardwood, uh, very oily, very um, durable, but also you need to use it in very small pieces because it's also very lively. So creating these, um, this new geometry on the old building and, and using the, the, the wood as a cladding to, to make it merge with the thatched uh, part of the building. And trying to, to change the proportions of the existing building by dragging down the roof and creating these small uh, recesses. Um, the interior is very abstract. There's an exhibition here. There's a very, um, a, a very good exhibition architect uh, that has done the exhibition, and he used uh, art and, um, and very sort of uh, handmade uh, materials together with, with, uh, with new media. Um, but we used the daylight um, together with this, uh, with this new media. So using the, the, the roof light here as part of the departure. So, so this uh, installation in a way is underlined by the daylight. Always using the daylight in a very simple way. So, so creating these diagonal spaces, uh, reflecting the, the, the light from the floor and, uh, and underlining the height of the, of the space uh, by roof light. And the laboratory here is, of course, very brightly lit. Things are changing all the time in here, so it's much more like a, a flexible space. And then, of course, creating the, the sense of being uh, in this landscape and being uh, present in the landscape, so you, you have this uh, relationship between inside and outside. So going um, to the far north, Iluli set uh, in 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. It's a small town 
the second largest in Greenland, uh, 5,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, and actually, it's a quite old um, town because there was um, there was already settlers here in the 17th uh, century. Uh, most of them going here for well uh, hunting, and because um, Europe used well uh, oil for their lamps, so there was a lot of uh, profit to to gain from from this area. And the reason why there was a lot of whales is because of uh, this glacier that is uh, UNESCO protected. Um, and is also the place where you can see uh, climate change very, very um, clearly since the glacier has been withdrawing, as you can see, from the, the edge of the Disco Bay all the way uh, 20 kilometers backwards. Uh, and every year it's withdrawing. So what you see in the back here, up here, is not working. Anyway, up there uh, is the ice cap. Uh, and the glacier, that is the, the most productive glacier, and always has been, um, produces uh, the icebergs that actually moves into the ice fjord. And because there's a ridge in the end of the ice fjord uh, towards the Disco Bay, all this ice will pack. It takes about a year for the icebergs to move out, and then they will calf again and move out into um, the Disco Bay um, and maybe hit some, some ships, hopefully not. Um, I think one of those were hitting the Titanic couple of, no, that was a, anyway. <laughs> so when you're working in the Arctic, um, there's one thing that you, you really need to understand is how the, the wind is moving the snow, because it, it's, um, the snow is here uh, for, for 10 months a year. Uh, it's not that it snows a lot more than anywhere else, but the snow is moving around, it stays and it, it's moving around. Um, and when the wind is twice as hard, harsh as here in Denmark, which is bad enough, um, they can really create a lot of trouble with these uh, snow buildups. So trying to understand um, when you create a building in Denmark, you would always try to create lee. If you do create lee, you also create uh, enormous uh, problems because the snow will build up exactly where there's lee. So, um, so understanding the prevailing winds and understanding how to make the, the, the snow actually move away from the building is part of this. So um, when we work with this as a boomerang uh, shape, uh, also to be able to see the ice fjord, but when we work with this, uh, we also work with the prevailing winds and um, in, a, in a wind tunnel, uh, we made these experiments with the potato flour to see how, how did the... Um, the, the snow build up. So, uh, as you see here, not a lot of snow build up um, compared to if you have a, um, a boxy uh, building. Also, the melt water uh, in the in the short summertime, uh, we need to to uh, to drain. Uh, so, lifting up the building uh, and letting the, the the melt water run into the small lake in, in front of the building is part of the the design. Also, there's one thing that's important to understand is that um, Inuit are nomadic people. There's not, uh, there is a building culture, you could say, but it's nomadic. It's, uh, uh, it's temporary. Uh, so what we wanted to do here was not to try to uh, create an igloo or uh, something like that. We wanted to, um, to create a tool uh, or something that, that was much more um, temporary uh, or looked much more temporary. So, um, so the, the, the construction is, is more like a skeleton of, a, of an animal or, or a, a tool like a kayak or, or other Inuit uh, tools. Because the bedrock is the oldest uh, in the world, and this is actually where uh, Minik Rosing discovered that the, uh, the globe is much older than we thought, or life on globe was much older, because you can discover this in this bedrock. The light here is, uh, is, is amazing. I mean, this is not a manipulated a picture, but because the, the, the angle of the sun is so, uh, so low and the, there's a lot of red, uh, then all the shadows become really blue uh, like this. So move, like when moving through the building, you are actually able to, to feel the, the red light from the west and the, the blue light from the eastern side of the building. So the, the whole building is, is tilting. Um, so you direct your view towards the ice fjord and then uh, towards the interior of the, um, of the site. And of course, light conditions are uh, 
extremely different here. The contrast is really uh, enormous. This is, of course, on a, on a winter day with a, an extremely diffused um, daylight. Everything is, um, there's no shadows um, and you can hardly see the sun. And during winter times where you do not have any sun at all, it's the reflection of the snow. Um, so it's the moon, it's the reflection of the sun on the moon, again reflected on the snow, um, which is a, 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 a absolutely magic uh, kind of light, but also very uh, different, not reflecting any any colors. And then, of course, this is a this is a cheap trick, but it's a. Uh, this is also what you can see, this phenomenon um, on the sky, which it actually lights up the, the, the whole area while it's on, and it, it lasts all night. So summer situation, winter situation is, is very different. The, the, the building itself works all year round um, uh, as a cultural uh, house, but also as an exhibition uh, building. So it's, it's both tourists and locals alike, and what we really uh, wanted to do was to create a, sp a place that was part of the landscape and part of, of a daily life, um, a meeting spot uh, out in this uh, enormous uh, uh, area. And so, as you see here, the, the, of course, the change of light, but also that there's actually uh, life around this building also in the winter time, um, moving into the, the daylight. So, uh, what we did was to uh, create a roof that is part of the path um, moving out into the UNESCO Heritage Park, uh, which is uh, very popular uh, for evening walks. So, um, so moving up uh, on, on the top of the roof, you can overview uh, the whole area and then you can move down and into, into the, um, through the wilderness. So in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a gable in between civilization and wilderness. Uh, and it's also a way of exposing the ice fjord uh, when you move uh, through the building. Uh, so you discover this for the first time when you're when the, on the edge of the boomerang. So, uh, so moving up uh, on the roof, um, and as you can see, you can't see the ice fjord from here. Um, you, you move up upwards and then you discover uh, the ice fjord, which is quite open at this picture, but sometimes it's absolutely uh, crammed with icebergs. And then moving down uh, into, the, into the park. So the, the interior is very much about uh, movement. It's also about changing views. So we created this uh, simple triangle that goes to a rectangle and then uh, moves to a triangle again. And it's all about this, uh, this rhythm um, and the, the set of pace uh, moving through the building because it's not, a, um, it's not a place where you turn around and go back. You need to move through and discover uh, the ice fjord. <coughs> So entering into this uh, enclosed space uh, where you change your shoes because you have uh, usually you would have very harsh uh, shoes on, so um, it's quite natural to change shoes and then moving into the to the space. So so this is an exhibition space that is absolutely daylit, which is very unusual. Again, we had uh, Shark Studio to to do the exhibition, uh, and they did a really great job uh, because it's not easy to to make an ex exhibition in full uh, daylight uh, and the. The reason why uh, we're not closing up the facade is, of course, that the exhibition is about uh, it's about climate change, it's about the ice fjord, and it's about the nature that is just um, just around you. And then moving through um, and ending your your journey uh, outside the building in in the in the park. Then, of course, uh, the celebration of uh, when the sun comes up the 12th of January, uh, 12th, I think. Um, uh, and it stays on for f 40 minutes and goes down again. It's part of a big celebration in town. Um, and when you move up to the roof, uh, you have this possibility of uh, overviewing um, this um, short sunset and sunrise. Uh, um, another, just shortly, um, a project we did uh, for the Babi Yar uh, Memorial Center in, uh, in Kiev that for obvious reasons are not going to be. Um, but in the story about this place is that somehow um, memory uh, can be erased uh, in, a, in a place. Uh, th this was a ravine or gorge in outside Kiev uh, and it's the, one of the um, single standing uh, catastrophes uh, or or um, homicide that you had during the war. It was in uh, 33,700 uh, Jews were 
um, uh, pushed out into this place and uh, shot and pushed into this ravine. And then during the war, uh, it was covered up. Um, and so there's no traces of the ravine anymore uh, and no traces of this uh, uh, crime to humanity. So the, the, um, the main idea in this building is in a way to try to recreate um, uh, the, the the ravine uh, and the feeling of of moving down into this uh, this ravine. Um, so the, the the main project is about not recreating the ravine because nobody actually knows exactly where it was, um, but to to recreate the feeling of moving down into into darkness um, and um, uh, and also again using the roof as a part of the uh, overview um, and also the part of the reconciliation, you could say. So moving down um, in this uh, gorge, and then uh, discovering uh, the daylight from only from above, um, and, and and through these um, quite um, deep um, courtyards that we created in, inside. So moving up again into into the daylight, and and hopefully um, both reflecting, but also um, reconciling. The last uh, building is the well, and I think we just uh, got to know that it's gonna uh, that it's fully financed now. So we're gonna start uh, hopefully soon doing the the project drawings. But the well is in again in the Arctic. Uh, it's uh, also 300 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, but this is Norway, so you have the Gulf Stream. It's much less harsh. Um, the waters are not closing up with ice, uh, so you have a very different situation here. The whales are, are close to the coast here. It's uh, an island north of Lofoten. Um, and, and what happens is that the whales need the sea bottom to find their way uh, when they cruise uh, to breed uh, on the other side of the ocean. Uh, and, and so that the, the way they, they, they find their way is by following these deep uh, uh, gorges or valleys in the, in the sea bottom. Um, and there's a, a very deep valley going very, very close to the coast of Andoya uh, uh, on this side, so it's actually possible to see uh, also the, the big tooth whales that need to dive deep to, to find food, to, find, to eat uh, uh, octopuses and stuff like that. Um, so you are able to see that quite close to the coast. So it's also a space or place where people will go for, um, to watch uh, whales from boats. So the site was this uh, small peninsula on the on the edge of the of the ocean, um, and this, the program was was as big as the island. So somehow it was very strange to put this building right on top of this um, beautiful uh, coastline. So what we decided to do was to create um, a building that was almost part of the. Uh, the, the crust of the earth and what we said was okay we so let's be a giant and let's cut uh, a slice into this um, to this island and and put the, the the building underneath and then again giving back uh, the, the the site not as was but uh, a new site uh, to the community and to the to the public um, so uh, so using local stone um, as as a cladding and um, it took us a long time we Every stone is kind of hand drawn. No, it's a, uh, it's it's to give the impression of using quite raw uh, stones uh, from the site uh, or close by uh, to 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 make the cladding and then create this artificial hill where you are able to not watch the whales because they're further out, but to to overview uh, the ocean. So it's it's a quite simple building. You have this shell. Um, uh, the, the, the crust of the earth and then you, underneath you have this soft, softly curved building that is following the topography of the island so you get very close to the water and you don't create this edge um, uh, that is signaling here's a building so we tried to make it um, uh, a non-building a non and then using the, the reflection of the water, being so close to the water uh, um, on, the, on the roof and the shell, so you have the reflection of water reflected on the, on the shell um, and creating this really uh, soft uh, daylight. Um, and as you see here, uh, there's no uh, visible uh, foundation. Um, there is, of course, but <coughs> not visible. 
Um, and being this close uh, to the water, of course, we need to be very careful uh, with, with the wind pressure and, and with the saline um, environment. So the interior is both uh, daylit and but also um, uh, darkness, so you can use this mixture of I immersive uh, media and and uh, uh, actually uh, art pieces and um, and uh, and real objects. And again, moving up, um, in a way, giving back uh, the landscape uh, and and using it as a as an open uh, public space. Thank you so much. I know the order that you like to sail, mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned uh, the light coming from the water. Maybe you could give us a bit more reflection on that. What, what does it mean? What sort of light do you get from, from the water surface? Well, I, I, I think that being... I think there's a very big cultural dif difference in being from a, uh, a country that is surrounded by water and or being from, uh, let's say, Switzerland. I think that the, the, and if we talk about the daylight condition, it's absolutely... Um, opposite, so the the um, being brought up in a country where the you know there's no longer than 40 kilometers any any kind of water, um, uh, with half half of the island or half of the country being islands, I think that's a, a sort of a deep down um, uh, urge you could say um, uh, that this this kind of uh, light that you get I mean it's also changing. Uh, during the day a lot, but it's also very reflected by by these surfaces. So when you have the mountains or you have the, um, the, the like being in Switzerland, it's a totally different daylight situation you have, and you you can really um, you know you need to to go back home once in a while if you're if you're not close to the water because it's kind of part of your um, yeah sort of deep down culture I think. So so being Scandinavian I think or being at least Danish or um, uh, maybe also Icelandic uh, or from the Faroe Islands. Um, the, that is part of your conditions, I think. And I seem to remember from sailing myself that the a particular thing about the way the light comes in with water is that it hits the ceiling inside the room. Yes. Is this something that you incorporate in your design? I think maybe with the whale, I think that's... Uh, uh, we really hope that that would be very visible. At least you'll have the diffused light from the water, so that will... Uh, um, the reflection will enhance uh, the daylight, but also, um, if you're lucky enough, you have this, uh, you know, much more... Uh, magical uh, effect of the ripples of the water, uh, but that you need a certain situation for that. Yeah. Mm. Right. So we have time for questions. If Hello, my name is uh, Anna. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I just had some thoughts about uh, these amazing buildings that I myself want to go to Greenland and Norway and everywhere to see. Uh, what are your thoughts about uh, these beautiful sceneries, uh, how to get there? Do you have to arrive on ski or can you arrive a large amount of people in cars and stuff like that? What are your uh, thoughts about changing the scenery and the, and the nature? And, and thank you for doing that, but what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, well, I think there's two questions in one here. Uh, one is... Um, a question that we had when we opened the house is, so why go to Greenland? You know, why fly to Greenland to see this amazing space? I mean, but nobody has. Uh, and you could say, yeah, well, you can also sail to Greenland, uh, but Greenland is an island, so you need to get there somehow. Um, and can you can you say that we should not go to Greenland, for example, because uh, because we need not to fly? And then you can, you know, actually, I I looked into the statistics of that, and I think nine million people alone is coming across uh, from uh, overseas to London every year and there's a hundred thousand people coming to Greenland so so which is a, a shorter ride so in that sense uh, it's it's in a in a much bigger discussion you know should we should we isolate everybody that's not living in Europe or in in the states or you know how how do we come by that so so that was one question and, and the second one if you go to Greenland there's no roads I mean you, you don't go from place to place uh, on in a car uh, there is cars of course in Iluli said but they drive on this um, you know one kilometer road from the airport to, to, to the center of the, of the town. Otherwise, uh, what you use here is uh, snowmobiles. Um, 
very much. And also there's 4,500 dogs in this uh, 5,000 people city. So you actually do use the dogs as a, as a transportation means. So, and you go by ski and, and so forth. So in that sense, I think it's, it's quite, um, I can get very, um, a little bit angry on the uh, uh, Green, Green, Greenlandic people's um, uh, on behalf of on behalf uh, because I think uh, it's really not fair uh, to 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 start being you know you know should you go by car should you not no you they actually uh, work with the with the nature and the landscape uh, in a in a modern way but they uh, they're not using a lot like we are you know so. Well, Norway, there's a, it's a there's a it's a small town. Um, um, you so there's a there's a, an air base actually on on uh, this small island. There's roads going for all the way from Oslo along the coast, so it's part of that um, mobility. Yeah, I don't think we'll change the place in that sense. So I have another question. I would like to go into your design process. Um, and maybe you could tell us a bit more about how you work with the light during the design process. Uh, do you computer generate the light or... or and, 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 and another question is, uh, do you sometimes get surprised when you actually see the buildings? <laughs> Always. <laughs> no, uh, no, I'm just surprised that we managed to build... No, I, I think that's... Um, I think we, the computer generated light is, of course, a possibility, but yes, uh, actually using the old-fashioned model um, as a means of measuring how this works, I think is much more precise somehow because you, this the 3D is an amazing tool, but it's also uh, very deceiving, and uh, you, you, I mean, you can turn on and, and down the lights, so you won't, you you can use. I actually we use the Velux uh, daylight um, tools also, but that's more about the level of light, but the quality of light. You, it's easier to see actually in a model because you can see the, the reflecting uh, surfaces and yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you sometimes uh, not want light deliberately? Do you have uh, any uh, examples of that working with darkness or the contrast maybe? Yeah, well, I think the Babi uh, project is the only project where we deliberately worked uh, with with darkness because it was such a dark story and it was. To me, um, it felt wrong to 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 brighten up this the spaces. So, so in that sense, it was very much to to create a um, a dark uh, dark space. I mean, not I mean, darkness needs light to be dark, uh, uh, and and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So, so you can never ha I mean, just full darkness is not interesting, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we can have uh, another question. Uh, there is one. Yes, hello. <clears throat> I'm Rebecca from Germany. And I read in the program that you or your office got an award for sustainability in 2022. And I just wanted to ask how you implement sustainability into your designs, how much that is a part of the design process, just apart from, you know, working together with nature, of course. But, yeah, how do you um, I think there's there's um, two things that's really important is you know is it necessary I mean that's the kind of more ethical part of the the, the approach is is it really ne necessary what we do is it necessary you know is the amount of space is the um, you know do we need uh, you know to spend a lot of resources on a huge overhang or uh, cantilever or so this kind of uh, I think the the discussing the necessity uh, is always uh, an important part of the of the design process, um, and and secondly, of course, the the, the d discussion on materials and CO2 embedded. Um, in, uh, we are very uh, much aware of this, and we work uh, deliberately also from the beginning of the design. So lately, we try to push, of course, um, all sorts of um, construction methods. It's really really difficult, and I think that's a, a discussion we need to have because you know not many clients wants to to go that far so so you you know lately we lost a competition because we reused the whole of an old uh, um, townhouse that was from the 60s Be actually very um, sound 
very easy to reuse with a beautiful park around and the the team that won this uh, competition tore everything down and, and and pleaded that this was more sustainable so so you know it's it we really have to uh, to to push very hard to also make uh, clients understand that this is urgent and it's not um, it's not a choice uh, but I think, uh, you know, back in the office, uh, we try to push it as much as possible, also in the, in the initial design. But things have changed, and our knowledge has changed a lot. So when you start building, uh, or you start, you, the well was one in 2000, I don't know, 16. Uh, the the Illudicet Ice Fjord Center was in 2015. So, so there's a long process from you know winning a competition and actually building the building um, but I mean we try to push it at as much as possible and I think we have a lot more knowledge also now than we had 10 years ago we have time for another question there is one so thank you very much for the great talk um, I'm interested to know how do you work with colors how do you accommodate colors with daylight and what kind of principles do you use and also, how do you manage to shorten the gap between what you imagine and how what a reality really is? You know, like yeah. uh, uh, for the final product. Yeah. I, I I think that we uh, I um, well the, I think there's different ways of creating uh, a vision, and um, to me, it's really important to know how the building is actually done. From the beginning, also when you know when we do a competition, we actually we don't detail it f fully, but we actually know uh, a lot about how this building is going to be constructed. And I think that it's not that it's better than uh, other ways. Are other 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 architects are more abstract in their approach, uh, and then you know they will have a vision and they will find out how to build it afterwards. Um, but s so knowing a lot about how this is going to be constructed. You also know quite a lot of materials and colors and, and daylight. Um, so um, I, I'm, maybe it's boring, but it, I have to say that m most of our buildings, when we do renders in the competition, uh, unless there was a catastrophe or uh, the budget kind of uh, blew away or something, you know, they actually end up looking like, like, like the render, you know. Thank you so much. My name's Lara, I'm with IKEA. Um, and thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your um, creation of the ultimate daylight experience on the roof, this space that we tend to underutilize. And of course, there's the uh, IKEA Copenhagen coming, that a big part is the roof as well. And I'm just wondering how you think about uh, activating that space, bringing, bringing people onto this uh, spot of light and view and orientation. Again, I think that's again about necessity. You know, it's not just a good idea to bring people up to the roof if, the, if it's not a natural movement. You know, so, so uh, in Iluli said, uh, you know, we discussed this quite a lot with the client. Is this, you know, is it a gimmick or is it, is it actually necessary? And, and, and we're happy to say that people get married on the, on the roof now. So it's kind of a, becoming a spot. Um, IKEA, I think, is the same thing. There was actually a master plan uh, uh, where you could move. Uh, it's you know, it's along the harbor front. It's a lot of traffic. You want to get up. You want to see uh, the water. Uh, so I think uh, the creating a park up there was, uh, in a way, natural. Vesterbro is a really dense area. Uh, there's a need of this, but but I think that's a very important discussion. I think you know, I hate when people. Bring, you know, think they can bring people up on roofs on the fifth floor, uh, unless there is a there is a kind of natural um, uh, path. Uh, I don't think you can do that unless you are in Hong Kong or in a really really dense city. Uh, and so, yeah. Thank you, Dorte, for um, a great uh, presentation and uh, and for the work that you actually uh, that you have been doing together with your fellow architects. Um, I think you have um, shown a lot of uh, uh, projects where the understanding of uh, of the place of the landscape is uh, is so clear, and uh, also the the balance between the use of materials and the place. Could you uh, could you elaborate a little bit on on the relation between um, 
or how you understand the place and uh, how you uh, come to these uh, solutions about uh, materials and stuff. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I, I guess we 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 try to think of uh, what we do as something that should look like it's always been there, somehow. It's not that it's not like we are humble or have small egos or anything like that. But it's just to 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 say it's a success when it looks like um, it's part of a um, 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 collaboration with the surroundings. Um, and in that sense, I think we spend a lot of time doing. Uh, research and find you know history, finding out what is this place about, and then of course there's a there's an intuitive uh, you know um, there's an in, in intuitive path from there. But I think we 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 do try to to take it really seriously. What what is this place about, um, both socially and 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 economically and and uh, you know so the context is more than you know looking around and see what's there. Um, so then hopefully it'll, it'll feel natural when it's there. Okay, thank you, Dorte, for showing your beautiful projects and also now taking us into your design uh, process. Uh, I think uh, this is very inspirational for students and other architects uh, present here. Um, this is being uh, taped, so actually um, if you want to use this uh, for teaching or something, you, it, you can go into the um, website that's called daylightandarchitecture.com uh, by Velux and uh, you can revisit this if you want to. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much.